Uh, so thank you for coming, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be back at Trieste Spring School. Um, this is my third time. The first time I came here 11 years ago as a graduate student, and uh, I re still remember uh, very nice talks back then. Marcos Marino was one of the speakers. I remember him talking about uh, topological B model and integrability, and uh, yeah, I really fondly remember that. So let me start, um, but uh, let me start very slowly, and let me first give you the overview. So the title of the talk is SDRity in uh, 4D n equals 2 theories. Can you read it? I hope you can. <laughs> uh, right. So my uh, main question, even bigger than this one, is this. How does a uh, very strongly coupled gauge theory behave? It's a very difficult question, fascinating question, and uh, it has fascinated so many physicists in the last few decades, not just last few decades, but more than half a century. But it's a very difficult question, so we'd like to start by starting from a simpler example. And first you notice that there are two types of strongly coupled gauge theories in four dimensions. One is, one type is where coupling uh, becomes strong, via renormalization group flow down to low energy. Another thing is another type of strongly coupled theory is that UV coupling constant doesn't run. So UV coupling is a parameter you can choose. You choose and you make it strong. So there are two types. The first type is rather difficult because the system becomes strongly coupled all by itself. So it's very hard to analyze. But in the second case, um, you can, it's you who are making problem uh, <laughs> difficult in some sense, right? It's a tunable controllable situation. So in this case, you can start from uh, carefully analyzing the weakly coupled case and slowly making the problem uh, harder. So to in the four lectures I'm going to give this time, I'd like to focus on the second type of the theories. And in particular, I'm going to impose lots of supersymmetry. So with SUSY, uh, this problem uh, is quite tractable. Thankfully. So there's a long history of uh, such a study of the strongly coupled behavior of Susie gauge theories. Uh, it all started in a paper by Montonen and Olive from uh, 77. So there they studied, well, it's not quite True, but in any case, they considered n equals four super ion mills. Simon has been talking about uh, scattering amplitudes of this theory, but uh, we consider n equals four super ion mills with SUN gauge group. This is clearly you can compute the beta function, and it's one loop finite. It is believed to be it known to be finite to all orders, and so this is a the second class of theories. And we believe that if you crank up the gauge coupling of this theory, eventually this is mapped to itself. So this is the strong weak coupling duality of n equals four super ion mills, and that's called S duality. And this is from 77. 
the next example uh, found in the literature is by Cyberg and Witten from 94. Uh, so this is n equals two. Supersymmetric gauge theory with SU2 gauge group with four flavors. Again, this is a one loop finite, believed to be finite to all orders. And uh, in this influential paper where they introduced the concept of the zyberg witten curve, to begin with, they also showed, uh, they gave a convincing evidence that the strongly coupled limit of this particular gauge theory becomes uh, basically the same theory, but with a different flavor charge assignment. So with four flavors, uh, I, I will explain it in more detail, but with four flavors, this theory has SO8 flavor symmetry. And uh, in the original theory, in the original theory, the matter fields is in the vector representation of this SO8, but in the dual theory, the matter fields are in different representation, so in the SO8 flavor symmetry, so it's a eight dimensional spinner representation. So that's in 94. So a natural question you ask is that, well, you can find a very similar example to this yeah. What does this SO8 symmetry? What does this symmetry? Pardon? No, I didn't understand the SO8 symmetry. What? Ah. So, so this SO8 symmetry, so let me say a bit more carefully. So, uh, so this jargon n if equals 4 means that you have four pairs of quark and anti quark fields. And the uh, I is one, two, four. I uh, is one, two, four. So this one, two is the gauge in indices. And there are four flavors. But uh, you know that in SU2, doublet and anti doublet are in fact the same thing. So it's more convenient to write this as. SU2 doublet with eight components. And the interaction term in the Lagrangian, in fact, uh, preserves SO8 uh, rotation of these fields. So that's the standard charge assignment of the original SU2 theory. So what Zyberg and Witten found was that if you crank up the gauge coupling of this theory, Eventually, you have some dual gauge theory with basically the same gauge group with the same matter content, but um, the, the assignment of the SO8 flavor representation needs to be changed. So if you know the Dinkin diagram of the SO8, you have three nodes corresponding to the eight-dimensional vector representation, eight-dimensional spinner representation, and eight-dimensional uh, con conjugate spinner representation, and it's your choice of assigning uh, the SO8 representation to this eight matter fields. So that's completely up to your choice. But what they found is that if you go to the strongly coupled dual description, you need to simultaneously change the flavor charge assignment. So this will become very important in the third lecture, I guess. So I will come back to this. Thank you for the question. So. Uh, um, everybody thought this should be generalizable, right? Um, if you know the one loop beta function, you can easily compute that n equals two gauge theory with S N uh, gauge group with n f equals two n. Uh, this theory is also uh, super conformal. I mean, the gauge coupling is tunable. And that is a special case where capital N is two. But for quite some time, people couldn't understand exactly what happens when you crank up the gauge coupling here. The problem was just as 
we can see from his question, um, this duality in the simplest case involves this accident, some mathematical accident which only exists for SO8. So it's not quite clear how to generalize this concept to this more general case. Uh, so the breakthrough came in a paper by Argyres Zyberg in 07, where uh, the SU3 case was treated. So what they found is that SU3 with NF equals six uh, in a very strongly coupled limit is dual to, uh, so it has a weakly coupled description with different gauge group SU2 coupled to just one copy of the uh, matter field together with some mysterious strongly coupled sector known as uh, minahan nemeshansky Z6 theory. I will come back to that. But uh, um, so there's a qualitative difference between these two cases. In this case, if you crank up the gauge coupling, eventually you find a dual description where everything is weakly coupled. But uh, that is a bit too good to be true in the general case. What Aguirre and Zeiberg noticed in 07 is that in this case, if you crank up the gauge coupling, you can go to a dual frame where you have weakly coupled SU2 gauge group, but you still have some uh, strongly coupled mysterious matter system coupled to this SU2. And quickly, Gaiotto in 09 generalized this to all SUN. Uh, yeah, general, general N case. So what I'd like to do today and in the four lectures to come is to uh, explain these dualities from a very basic point of view. So Gaiotto's uh, great insight is that he gave a very general perspective point of view to understand these s uh, in one go. So what he found is that s in, so I, I didn't have to erase this, but <laughs> for the n equals two, uh, can be understood uh, by uh, compactifying putting something called 60, n equals two comma zero theory on a Riemann surface. So Riemann surface can be split in various ways and that corresponds to various uh, weakly coupled limits. So that's what he found. And that explains a lot of thing about this mysterious occurrence of strongly coupled matter field in the dual frame. So, so in this SU3 case, we had some strange matter content in the du dual side. That's inevitable because, I mean, this 60 theory itself, so this doesn't have useful Lagrangian so far. Lagrangian description. Many people try. There are some, but it's not useful yet. So if you start from a very strange theory in 6D and compactify that on 4D to 2,4D, you would expect you get something very strange, and that's the generic situation. But sometimes, even you, if you start from this strange theory, you get a very understandable thing in 4D, and that allows us to understand uh, the strongly coupled behavior of the gauge theory better. 
in, in, even in four dimensions. Uh, another line of development uh, started by Davide Gaiotto is the following. So let's consider this six-dimensional theory on some four-dimensional four manifold times a Riemann surface. Right. That's right. Um, so you need to use various indirect methods to study these things. So sometimes you know that the resulting 4D theory is a Lagrangian theory. Sometimes you don't. Um, typically, you can compute uh, two-point functions of currents and s such things. Yeah, and you need to guess exactly what these uh, 4D theories are. But I, I will come to concrete examples later. Thank you for the question. So let's start from this product space situation and consider computing some partition function of this. And let's n name, let's give a name to this object. So let's call this 60n equals 2 comma 0 theory, just theory S, 6D. So this is a partition function of this S6D theory on this product space-time. If the Riemann surface is very, very small, you can first compactify along that small Riemann surface and consider this system as a four-dimensional theory. So in that case, you have some 4D theory determined by the Riemann surface. And you are considering that theory on X4. So that's one way to analyze. There's another way to analyze the system. So if suppose x4 is smaller than this c2, then you can do the same thing. So you first compactify along x4, then you have some two-dimensional theory determined by this x4, and you consider that theory on a Riemann surface, right? Of course, in the general situation, these things are all different. You need to take limiting procedures. But suppose you consider a nice if, so if Z60 is a nice uh, SUSY partition function uh, that doesn't depend on the size, So this is a big assumption of your choice of precise background. But suppose this is the case. In that case, and the size doesn't matter. Therefore, uh, yeah, I guess I should use a colored chunk. In this case, the three things I just wrote on the blackboard are the same. So this becomes the same because this shouldn't depend on the size of C2. This shouldn't depend either. And because these are the same, we should have some relation of a partition function of some 4D theory on a 4D spacetime and a partition function of some 2D theory on a 2D spacetime. So, uh, So these days, this four-dimensional theory determined by the Riemann surface, there are tons of them because there are tons of Riemann surfaces. You can even add various punctures to it. And these are called class S theories. I don't know who introduced the terminology. It appeared around 2012. No, 2000. Already had the name class S theory? Oh, thank you. S stands for 
okay, yeah, that's, a, that's an easy choice. <laughs> so until now, I didn't know what this S stands for. Ah, uh, great, great. <laughs> so that, yeah, all right. By knowing the origin of the name, it seems so less mysterious, which is too bad. <laughs> so apparently this stands for six. All right, such mundane choice. Anyway, <laughs> more interesting thing is that uh, if you compactify 6D theory on S4, we now know this is a 2D uh, Liouville theory, uh, in general, Toda theory. And another famous example is S2D, and if you instead consider S3 times S1, uh, you get something called 2D Q deformed Jan Mills. So uh, before getting further, I would like to mention that this equations, these equations are amazing to me. Usually in the physics, when we write equations, uh, both sides of the equations are numbers or functions. Here, in these equations, both sides are quantum field theories. So we are now, I mean, QFT knowledge of the human beings as a whole has progressed to a certain stage where we can now write down equations between quantum field theories. So I, I feel good about it, but <laughs> we need to proceed. Uh, so, uh, so, um, so I, I already said it, that this is my third time here. Uh, when I came here in 2010 or 11 as a lecturer, I talked about this, this particular equation. So I don't want to repeat that. So this time I'd like to uh, explain to you about this third equation. And in my perspective, in my uh, subjective way of viewing things, um, this is much more understandable than this one because this is simpler, tractable, contains lots of information, easily extractable. So I really like this version better. So that's a very general overview of uh, what I'm going to do in the rest of the lectures. And before getting further, let me mention that uh, I kind of have a, a lecture note for this. It's not exactly the lecture note for this uh, set of four lectures, but my, a friend of mine forced me to write a short introductory uh, notes about these two relations, and that's available as a preliminary draft. So let me just say the URL. So member.ipm.jp, ug.tachikawa, and uh, temporary file, and 2d4d.pdf. Or maybe it was 4d2d.pdf, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, you, you can try either, and you will find the file. So, so you, you don't really have to take the notes, but uh, yeah. Right, so, so this is the very general introduction. And uh, since I have a nice blank space here, let me just give you a general contents of lectures, I would start as an appetizer, talking about 2D, QD form the mills first. I mean, we'd like to study 4D gauge theory, but as a toy model, 2D gauge theory is a very, very instructive example. And then I move on to the very basic facts about 4D n equals to Lagrangians. And then I will cover SU2, NF equals four, and its 
superconformal index. So this superconformal index is another name for S3 times S1 partition function. And I will, once I get to the point, I will give some 6D interpretation. And then I will discuss the generalization to general SUN. General, general, generalization to SUN. So I'm not sure how far I can go. I'd like to explain various things concretely. So I might not, do, I might not get to this generalization part, but, but it should be okay. Um, SU2 examples are instructive enough. So any questions up to this point? Yeah. Uh, do you any on the um, so, in order for this kind of analysis to work, um, there should be a way to add background fields that couples to the theory that preserves uh, some amount of supersymmetry in the total space. That gives you some constraint on the choice of usable four manifolds. And uh, people have been classifying possible types of four manifolds you can use in this way. So typically, easy thing you can do is to take the orbifold of either of these things, and you get various complicated things. And even that case is not completely understood. More questions? All right. So let me start with 2D YAMLs. Pardon? So sorry, sorry. Um, S4, I don't think it's a complex manifold, so it's not required. Um, so there are a series of works by Zyber and Festuccia and Domitorescu where they discussed exactly which manifolds allow some number of remaining supersymmetries. So you can typically take one of them, plug this in, and do the rest. So, so I'd like to discuss 2D Q-deformed young males, but before getting there, of course we should discuss undeformed QD, uh, 2D young males, right? So let's just discuss 2D young males theory. It's such a simple theory. In 2D, there's no physical propagating degrees of freedom. Uh, so let, let's take G as the gauge group, some non-abelian B group. Ah, so everything I say can be found in a great array view of 2D YAMLs, either by Bulao Thompson or by uh, Cordes, Ramgulam, and Mua. They are cited in my uh, lecture note. So if you are interested in a very detailed structure of 2D YAMLs, you can find everything there. But let, let me introduce to you how this thing works. So it's, this is a really simple theory. So if you consider this in a flat space, you don't get much. So instead, let's consider this in a general two-dimensional manifold uh, in a Euclidianized sense. And Lagrangian is, so this is the coupling constant. I could use G, but uh, I cannot use G because I'd like to use generic metric, which is denoted by G. And uh, you have the standard kinetic term. So this is the Lagrangian. Nothing spectacular. But in 2D, something 
uh, interesting happens. In 2D, the only non-zero component of f mu nu is f01, right? So you can rewrite, rewrite, trace f mu nu, trace f mu nu very explicitly as g00, g11, minus g01, g10, trace f01 squared. And as you know, this is determinant inverse, inverse, right? So if you plug this back in, what you find What you find is that S is just given by d squared sigma, a dead g squared inverse, trace F01 squared. So you see that explicit components of the metric never appears. G mu nu only enters into Lagrangian in this combination. In 2D, as, uh, giving determinant of G means that if you have a two-dimensional surface and given a very small patch, you can measure its area because it's given by determinant of g times dx dy. But uh, in the Lagrangian, um, there's no need to specify exactly what is the metric. All you have to do is to specify the area element. So from this, you can see that uh, uh, 2D YAMLs only depends on the area. So this is a good thing to know. And uh, this coupling constant can be absorbed into a redefinition of the area or just set in the scale of the area. So from now on, I can just ignore, ignore it. So let me just uh, give you a Venn diagram before proceeding. So there are tons of 2D QFT, many of which are very complicated, right? And uh, many of you know there is something called CFTs. So CFTs are some very special QFTs which depends only on the complex structure of the Riemann surface. So that's a special type of 2D QFT. But we just learned that there is another type of special QFT uh, which doesn't have a nice name, but uh, we can call it area FT, where uh, the theory only depends on the area, total area of the surface. And you can have some intersection between the two. If a QFT, 2D QFT only depends on complex structure and also only depends on the area, then this is purely topological. So this intersection becomes 2D uh, TQ, topological quantum field theory. But uh, it's important to remember that 2D YAMLs is an area field of theory, if that's the word. So how do we solve it? Um, solving it using path integral is also very instructive, but due to the lack of time, let me just do it in uh, Hamiltonian formulation, which is very instructive again. So the easiest space time is of this form. So it's a cylinder. So let's say this is x0, and this is side is x1. This periodicity is L. This length is ta t. And uh, so this is the time direction. Maybe I should have drawn this vertically. So in any quantum field theory, so this is a constant time slice. Given a constant time slice, you should have a Hilbert space of the system. So what's the Hilbert space of this system, of the 2D young males? Um, so classically, what's the, what characterizes the gauge field configuration on S1? So what you can do is to pick an origin here and define a group element, which is path of that exponential from zero to L of A1, dx1. Uh, right. So this is a nice 
almost gauge invariant object defined by integrating the uh, gauge field around S1 once. But of course, you need to remember that there's a residual gauge symmetry at this origin, right? So if you have, if you perform a gauge transformation by G, U is sent to G, U, G inverse. So this is the residual gauge invariance. Therefore, uh, the Hilbert space of states of this theory uh, is given by uh, wave function psi depending on U, which is invariant under this gauge transformation. So this is the space of wave functions. So such a function is known as a class function. Class function on G. Uh, what are the class functions? Typical example is the character in some representation R. So this is just trace R. A trace in the representation R of this matrix U. And it's known that chi R for all irep R uh, spans HS1. So this is a mathematical theorem. Uh, inner product can be nicely given by a standard integral over G. So let me just give it to you. Um, so if you have two such things, so you would like to take the inner product and you integrate that over the space of U using the standard Haar measure, and this is given by just the delta function of the labels. So it's a very nice orthonormal basis of HS1. So now we know the Hilbert space. What's the Hamiltonian? So I'm using a canonical approach, so we just write down the Hamiltonian. So this is an integral from zero to L of electric field squared up to some constant. I mean, in 2D, there's no magnetic field. You just have F01, which is the electric field. And in quantum theory, this is given by, electric field is given by the Sorry, the X one. Yeah. In the standard canonical quantization, electric field is the conjugate momentum to the gauge field, and so you get this. So you can really directly act this H on, say, this chi R of U. You can really compute it. So this is trace of R and uh, P exp and uh, zero to L and A1, DX1, right? So we can take a gauge where this A1 is constant along the X1 direction, but this H just hits uh, a twice, and in order to see the process more carefully, I guess we should introduce a joint indices A, so this is a sum over A, and uh, it's better to write it as T A, A1 A, so this T is the representation matrix in the representation R, so if you hit this U by one par variational derivative, you just get one factor of T A, so this is basically trace R, and uh, integral to zero, zero to L, T A, T A, 
dx1, and you have original uh, px 0 to L, TAA1A, DX1. But you know that in an irreducible representation, this is just a value of the quadratic Casimir. So you found that this is equal to L. So th there's an integral, right? So this is L times quadratic Casimir of R times chi r of u. So we know that these representation basis is in fact the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian of the 2D young males. And the Hamiltonian is given by uh, quadratic Casimir. So we are talking about this situation, but for example, we can further identify this part and this part, identify. So you get the torus uh, you can compute a partition function and this is given by trace over the Hilbert space of exponential of minus h t right and because we know the Hamiltonian and the basis here you can very explicitly write as a sum over the irreducible representation of exponential of minus t times h is l times c to r, right? So this is the partition function on the torus. As I already told you, the partition function only depends on the area, right? Here we arbitrarily introduce the length l and length t in the system, but the final answer depends only on the area, as I already claimed. So now you see that. Next step, uh, let's consider the following geometry. So this is a disk with area A here, disk. So it only has one boundary. And in such a situation, you get, so you still have some Hilbert space associated with the boundary, and you get the wave function determined by doing a pass integral of the system with given boundary condition, fixing holonomy to be u. So we'd like to determine this thing, psi a of u. Uh, these are called hartle hawking wave functions. originally introduced in the context of cosmology. So the world starts from nothing and pops up. And that uniquely determines some nice wave function. And 2D Young Mills is simple enough so that we can know this creation from the nothing. So this is hard Hawking wave function. How do we determine it? So there's a first nice trick of changing the area so adjoining a cylinder of psi area A prime gives you a disk with A plus A prime. And we know this cylinder contribution. This is just the action of the Hamiltonian. So this means that psi A prime, A plus A prime of U is given by exponential of minus uh, area times H. Uh, I guess I'm using some wrong normalization of H, but you get the idea. Right? So you can easily change the area. Therefore, it suffices to know the zero area wave function. So what's that? The zero area wave function uh, can be understood in a pass integral point of view. So we have a very big space time, right? And you have a zero area disk cut out of it. You might not be able to see it, but you get the idea. This is very, very small. 
You see? Very, very small. Therefore, the homonomy around it, U, needs to be basically 1. Therefore, zero area limit of this disk wave function should be just the delta function. But as always, in the case of delta function, this is not square integrable. So natural normalization is not very clear. So let's just put the arbitrarily constant alpha. So this is the result. Of course, you can write it in representation basis. So let's say this is given by uh, CR. C is already used too much. Mm. F, FR, chi R, U. Now, how do you know chi R, uh, F, F of R? All you have to do is to multiply uh, chi R prime U and integrate over u. So on this side, because of the orthogonality, you get just f of r prime. On this side, because this is a delta function, you just get chi r prime 1 times alpha. And this is a dimension. of this representation. So you know that this, is, this has an expansion of this from alpha, dimension of r, times chi r u. So very explicit. So now we know the disk amplitude. And finally, let's determine uh, this geometry. Let's consider this geometry. So this is a pants with three holes with area A. So in this case, you have three Hilbert space associated with it. Therefore, this should determine a vector in HS1 tensor, HS1 tensor, HS1, or equivalently, if you assign three holonomies, u1, u2, and u3, uh, some wave function u psi of a, u1, u2, u3. So how do we determine, how do we determine the three boundary wave function? It is, in fact, very easy by using the following trick. So if you have a three boundary uh, pants, you can glue a disk, right? This is, and I already told you repeatedly that the final result only depends on the area. So this becomes a cylinder. Right? We know the wave function here. We know the wave function here. This is the exponential of the Hamiltonian. Therefore, you can determine this part. I'm not going into the detail, but let me just write down the answer, which is very beautiful. Uh, So this psi a of u1, u2, u3 is given by the sum over r of exponential of area times c to r and uh, you have chi r u1, chi r u2, chi r u3 divided by dimension of r and times r alpha, which is a normalization constant. So it's a good exercise for you, if you haven't done that, to plug this in 
to this equation and check the equality, which is a very useful exercise. Now that you have the wave function uh, for the three punctured, three boundary sphere, you can glue that in various ways. You know my drawing is terrible. <laughs> so you can take one, two, three of these wave functions and glue at one, two, three points to get, uh, say, genus one, we surface with three boundaries. You can easily find the wave function by multiplying. So the corresponding wave function is, again, given by a sum over R of A C to R of product over the old boundary of chi R of UI divided by dimension of R of uh, 2G plus, minus 2 plus N where n is the number of boundary. Ah, and I forgot to in include this important normalization factor. So this is basically what I plan to tell you today, but uh, let's, let me say a few words about this constant alpha. What is this? So originally, this came from the fact that the disk amplitude, when the area is zero, is a delta function, which is not square integrable. Therefore, there is no natural normalization, and that introduces this. Another way to see that, uh, from the path integral point of view, is that on a genus G Riemann surface, sorry, genus G surface, if you do a quantum field theory, it's very easy to generate a counter term of this form. This is a diffeomorphism invariant combination of the metric. And uh, in renormalization, typically every term which is allowed by the symmetry is generated through regularization and renormalization. So if you do a path integral, typically you get some num number, some amount of this term is generated over the Riemann surface. But if so, Suppose such a term is generated uh, on a closed Riemann surface, this evaluates to 2g, so 2 minus 2g. Therefore, this multiplies, this multiplies s, uh, I mean z by exponential of beta times two minus two G. So this has exactly, and if you introduce the boundary, you get a similar factor. So you can understand this as an effect of possible finite renormalization, which is inherent in quantum field theory. I should also mention that uh, we took a very nice basis, chi alpha of U. This is also normal. Uh, in HS1, right? That, that's why we get this nice formula, but uh, um, if I am very stupid, uh, um, if some, some strange person might choose a different basis, I mean, how should I say? So this, this, is, this choice was possible because we introduced the inner product. Inner, this is because inner product was just a, I mean, psi u, psi prime u bar du, right? But if you choose a, a bit strange inner product, say,
it's totally possible to choose some strange additional factor in a different inner product. Um, orthonormal in this case basis is changed to uh, KU inverse chi r u, right? So I, I'm just redefining the inner product in a trivial way. But that just introduces some superior factor. But that would introduce some superior factor k of u. Uh, maybe in inverse in this convention. In the amplitude for the uh, 2D amulet's partition function. So this alpha is a certain renormalization constant. And this additional ambiguity k is a choice in the inner product. But remember, this is independent of R. So this is just comes from the inner product. So uh, I have three minutes left. This is undeformed to the young males. We need to discuss Q deformed young males. What, did it, what is it? So there are many ways to introduce Q deformed young males, but uh, the most conceptual way is the following. So, so far, we considered gauge group G to be the standard Lie group. You deform it to something called quantum group. So, in general dimensions, uh, gauge theory with quantum group as the gauge symmetry it's very hard to define. Uh, so quantum group is a kind of a non-commutative group. I mean, group are non-commutative in general. But uh, what happens is that the entries, matrix entries themselves, uh, become non-commutative. So that's the kind of deformation. Let me just give you an idea. So SU2Q in 2 by 2 representation has this entries alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So if there's no deformation, the, the entries themselves are commutative. But after the deformation, you get alpha, beta becomes Q, beta, alpha. And alpha, gamma becomes Q, gamma, alpha, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to, so you try to define a 2D young males with, in a lattice formulation, say, where all of the link variables are replaced by the quantum group elements instead of Lie group elements. You tr can try to do that in any dimensions, but because of the non-commutativity, you need to specify exactly in which order various link variables appear in the path integral, and that's only doable, I mean, it's known to, at least in two dimensions, how to consistently do that. So that determines a gauge theory where the gauge group is literally uh, the quantum group. You can do, if you know a bit of quantum group theory, you can almost exactly follow what I discussed. The end result is very simple. You just replace this dimension of R into something called quantum dimension. So at this level, all of the change is just, this becomes dim Q of R. And uh, when G is SUN, then dim Q of R has a very explicit representation, which is chi of R. 
in, and you have some diagonal elements and Q. So you need n by n matrix, right? So you take a diagonal element So this is the Q deformed dimensions. So you can check that this becomes standard chi r of one, which is the dimension r of one. So that's the Q deformation. Right, so that's what I wanted to say for this first lecture. Thank you very much.